five red heifers. All these elements are in place for what some Jews and Gentiles believe is the key to building the third Jewish temple. Red heifers, a crucial element for the third temple, have secretly arrived in Israel. And you know what that means? It's a strong sign that the third temple might start very soon. Can you imagine the excitement and anticipation? But hold on tight because we're about to dive deep into this thrilling topic today. So in this video, let's uncover the mystery behind these red heifers and what they signify for the future of the Third Temple. The ancient Hebrew prophets foretold that in the end times, the exiled people of Israel would return to their promised land and the temple would be reconstructed. As Ezekiel chapter 37 verse 28 states, then the nations will know that I, the Lord, make Israel holy. When my sanctuary is among them forever, these extraordinary events of the end times are now happening right before us. The prophetic return to Israel and the Third Temple. In Amos chapter 9 verses 14 to 15, it is written, I will bring back my exiled people Israel. They will rebuild the ruined cities and live in them. They will plant vineyards, drink their wine, make gardens and eat their fruit. I will plant Israel in their own land. Never again to be uprooted from the land I have given them. This passage highlights God's promise to restore Israel and allow them to flourish in their homeland. Despite skepticism from many around the world who claim that Israel's rebirth is solely the work of humans, Scripture emphasizes that God never intended to reject His people forever. In Isaiah it is stated, You, Israel, my servant Jacob, whom I have chosen descendant of Abraham my friend, you whom I have taken from the ends of the earth and called from its remotest parts, and said to you, You are my servant. I have chosen you and not rejected you, Isaiah chapter 41 verse 9. This reaffirms God's unwavering commitment to His chosen people. God's plan has always been to bring the Jewish people back to their land on His terms, not through human efforts alone. As foretold by the prophets, Jewish people are returning to the Holy Land from all corners of the globe after centuries of exile. Isaiah chapter 43 verses 5 to 6 proclaims, Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, Give them up, and to the south, Do not hold them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Furthermore, efforts to rebuild the Third Temple are underway, led by organizations like the Temple Institute and the Temple Mount. These developments align with Scripture's prophecies, indicating the unfolding of God's divine plan for His people and the restoration of their sacred heritage. But why build the Third Temple? Isaiah chapter 8 verse 18 is written, Here am I and the children the Lord has given me. We are signs and symbols in Israel from the Lord Almighty who dwells on Mount Zion. This verse suggests that Isaiah and his children serve as signs of God's presence among his people. You might wonder if the sanctuary was a copy and a shadow of what is in heaven, Hebrews chapter 8 verse 5, and Jesus serves in the sanctuary, the true tabernacle set up by the Lord, Hebrews chapter 8 verse 2. Why consider building the holy temple? The holy temple in Jerusalem wasn't just a physical structure, but a sacred place where God's divine presence dwelled on earth. God instructed, let them construct a sanctuary for me, that I may dwell among them. Exodus chapter 25 verse 8. This dwelling, represented by the Hebrew word shaken, gives rise to the concept of the Shekinah, symbolizing God's presence. While the term Shekinah isn't found in the original Hebrew Bible, it's used in rabbinic literature and translations to describe God's divine presence. The prophet Ezekiel witnessed the departure of this divine presence from the temple Ezekiel chapter 10 verses 18 to 19. However, he also foresaw rebuilding an eternal dwelling place for God on the temple mount in Jerusalem. Ezekiel described the glory of the Lord entered the temple through the gate facing east. I heard someone speaking to me from inside the temple. He said, Son of man, this is the place of my throne and the place for the soles of my feet. This is where I will live among the Israelites forever. Ezekiel chapter 43 verses 4 to 7. Rambam, also known as Rabbi Moses Maimonides, a medieval Jewish philosopher and Torah scholar, emphasized the eternal significance of the temple. In his work, Hilchos Beis Habachira, the laws of God's chosen house, Rambam outlined the two main purposes of the temple. Firstly, it served as a place where the divine presence of God was revealed, particularly above the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. This is reflected in Exodus chapter 25, verse 22, where God says above the cover between the two cherubim that are over the Ark of the Testimony, I will meet with you and give you all my commands for the Israelites. 
The temple also facilitated the offering of required sacrifices. However, since the destruction of the second temple in Ad 70, the Jewish people have been unable to offer these sacrifices. This has significant implications as 202 out of the 613 mitzvot commandments in the Torah cannot be performed without a temple, as noted by the Temple Institute. As a result, Jewish worship has shifted to local community synagogues and the study of the Torah. Instead of animal sacrifices, they now focus on prayer, tefillah, repentance, teshuva, and charity, tezedaka. While many believe that animal sacrifices have been permanently discontinued, biblical prophecy suggests otherwise. The prophet Ezekiel describes in Ezekiel chapter 42 verse 13, Then he said to me, The north and south rooms facing the temple courtyard are the priests' rooms, where the priests who approach the Lord will eat the most holy offerings. There they will put the most holy offerings, the grain offerings, the sin offerings and the guilt offerings for the place is wholly a future temple where priests will once again offer prescribed sacrifices. This raises a significant question for the Jewish community and all believers in Yeshua, Jesus. Will the next temple, often referred to as the third temple, be the temple described by Ezekiel, where the divine presence will dwell once again? Or will some other presence reside in a different temple? Red heifer the necessity for the ritual of the third temple, in accordance with the Old Testament law detailed in Numbers 19. The Israelites' purification from uncleanness required the ashes of a red heifer. Because these ashes were essential for the purification rituals conducted at the temple, the appearance of a red heifer today has been seen by many as a sign of the impending construction of the third temple. And the return of Christ. According to rabbinical tradition, nine red heifers have been sacrificed since the time of Moses. However, since the second temple's destruction, no red heifers have been slaughtered. Rabbi Maimonides, a prominent Jewish scholar, taught that the tenth red heifer would be sacrificed by the Messiah himself. Recently, the Temple Institute, an organization advocating for constructing a third temple, reported that five flawless red heifers from Texas arrived in Israel, which many interpret as a fulfillment of prophecy and a significant step toward building a new temple. The Mosaic Law specified strict criteria for the red heifer. It had to be without defect or blemish, and had never borne a yoke numbers chapter 19 verse 2. Moreover, the sacrifice of the red heifer was distinct from other offerings as it involved a female animal, was performed away from the entrance to the tabernacle, and was the only sacrifice where the color of the animal was specifically prescribed. In Numbers chapter 19 verses 1 to 10, the process of slaughtering a red heifer is described. Eliezer, the priest, oversaw the ritual outside the Israelites' camp. After the heifer was killed, Eliezer sprinkled some of its blood toward the front of the tabernacle seven times. Then he supervised the burning of the heifer's carcass, adding cedar wood, hyssop, and scarlet wool to the fire. The ashes of the red heifer were collected and stored in a ceremonially clean place outside the camp. These ashes were used in the water of cleansing for purification from sin. The law detailed how the ashes were to be used in purifying those who came in contact with a dead body. They were to purify themselves with the water containing the ashes on the third and seventh days after contact with death. The commands regarding the red heifer foreshadowed Christ's sacrifice for believers' sins. Jesus, like the red heifer, was without blemish. He was sacrificed outside the camp, just like the red heifer, Hebrews, and just as the ashes of the red heifer cleanse people from the contamination of death. The sacrifice of Christ saves believers from the penalty and corruption of death. The red heifer ritual, as outlined in the Mosaic Law, was relatively straightforward. However, over time, Judaism added numerous standards and extra criteria. Talmudic tradition delves into specifics such as the type of rope used to bind the red heifer, the direction it faced during slaughter, the words spoken by the priest, the requirement of wearing sandals during the ritual, and more. Rabbinical rules outlined various disqualifications for a red heifer, including if it had been ridden or leaned on, if a garment had been placed over it, if a bird had rested on it, or if it had two black or white hairs, among other conditions not mentioned in the biblical text. According to the futurist perspective of eschatology, Jerusalem will have a third temple. Jesus prophesied a temple desecration during the tribulation, indicating the need for a temple to exist for such an event to occur. Matthew chapter 24 verse 15 CF 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 4 If those responsible for dedicating the end times temple adhere to Jewish law, they will require the ashes of a red heifer mixed with water for ceremonial cleansing. 
If a blemish-free red heifer has been found and is in Israel, this could be seen as another piece falling into place. To fulfill biblical prophecy, Scripture explicitly contrasts the red heifer ceremony with the greater sacrifice of Christ. The ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean sanctify them, so that they are outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit, offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God? Hebrews chapter 9 verses 13 to 14 Arrival of Red Heifers Five perfectly red heifers, necessary for the ritual purification of individuals who have come into contact with a dead body, have arrived in Israel from a ranch in Texas. This event marks a significant step in the preparations for the construction of the Third Temple in Jerusalem by the Temple Institute. These heifers, all under one year old, must remain entirely red and free of any blemishes to be considered eligible for use in creating the ashes required by Jewish law for purification rituals. This level of purification is crucial for allowing the Kohanim priests to perform their duties in a future temple. Upon their arrival, the prize cattle were taken to Haifa, where they will undergo quarantine for a minimum of seven days per the Israel Veterinary Authority regulations. After the quarantine period, they will be relocated to two separate locations in Israel, one of which will eventually be accessible to the public. The heifers will receive proper care and nourishment at these locations until they reach their third year. At this point, they will be slaughtered and transformed into the necessary ashes. The heifers were brought to Israel with the assistance of the Bone Edge Israel Organization, which includes Jewish and Christian members. Byron Stinson, a Texas rancher who serves as a fundraiser and advisor for the organization, raised the cattle. For upon their arrival, a ceremony was held at Ben Gurion Airport to welcome the heifers. Officials from the Temple Institute, including Rabbi Chanan Kupiki, Rabbi Zaki Mamo, Rabbi Yisrael Ariel and Rabbi Azariah Ariel participated in the ceremony alongside Stinson and Netanel Isaac, the Director General of the Jerusalem and Heritage Ministry. Stinson said, I didn't set out to do this, but right now I am probably the best red heifer hunter in Texas. He expressed his commitment to fulfilling the biblical commandment and acknowledged his role in bringing the red heifers to Israel for purification. He emphasized the significance of the red heifer in building the temple likening it to a key that unlocks its functionality. A devout Christian, Stinson felt a strong personal connection to this commandment and began breeding cattle with the specific trait required for the red heifer. Political and religious challenges to the construction of the Third Temple The construction of the Third Temple encounters various challenges, both political and religious. Central to these challenges is the Temple Mount, a revered site in Jerusalem for Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. It's believed to be the original location of previous temples. However, significant Islamic structures like the Al-Aqsa Mosque and the Dome of the Rock pose a complex issue. The Temple Mount has become a focal point of tension in the Arab-Israeli conflict. Excess restrictions for Palestinian Muslims and Israeli excavations nearby are contentious issues. The fate of the holy site is of great concern for Muslims, as discussions about the Third Temple involve intricate religious, political, and cultural considerations. These factors make the Temple Mount a sensitive and challenging aspect of any plans to construct the Third Temple, the Antichrist. In the prophetic writings of the Book of Daniel and the Brit Shadasha, New Testament, a rebuilt temple in the end times plays a pivotal role. Both Daniel and Yeshua, Jesus, foretell the defilement of this Third Temple by the Anti-Messiah before the true Messiah's return. They term this spiritual contamination within the Temple as the Abomination of Desolation, as quoted in Matthew chapter 24 verses 15 to 16, where Jesus urges understanding by saying, the abomination that causes desolation, spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand right. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. This aligns with Daniel's prophecies in Daniel chapter 9 verse 27, chapter 11 verse 31, and chapter 12 verse 11. Daniel's prophecy further elucidates that the Messiah will be cut off before the temple's destruction as stated in Daniel chapter 9 verse 26 after the 62 weeks, the Messiah Meshach will be cut off and have nothing. And the people of the prince ruler Nagid, who is to come, will destroy the city and the sanctuary. These intertwined prophecies paint a detailed picture of the events surrounding the third temple, the anti-Messiah, and the ultimate return of the true Messiah. This prophecy was fulfilled in A.D. 70 when the temple was destroyed, nearly 40 years after Yeshua Hamashiach, Jesus the Messiah, was executed on the cross. 
through an extensive examination of various end-time scriptures, it is believed that the prince or ruler, Nagad the Anti-Messiah, will emerge exactly as Daniel describes. Daniel specifies that this figure will establish a covenant of peace for one week, typically interpreted as seven years, yet he will break this covenant midway. In Daniel chapter 9 verse 27, it is written, and he, the prince, will make some translations say confirm, affirm, covenant with the many for one week. But in the middle of the week he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. And on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate some interpretations say, set up an idol on the wing or precipice of the temple, even until a complete destruction, one that is decreed, is poured out on the one who makes it desolate. This aligns with Matthew chapter 24 verse 15. So when you see standing in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation, spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand. And 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 4, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped so that he is God sitteth in the temple of God, shewing himself that he is God. Moreover, the anti-Messiah will audaciously declare himself to be God as stated in 2 Thessalonians 2 4. He the man of lawlessness will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or his worship, so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. These prophecies provide intricate insights into the character and actions of the anti-Messiah in the end times under construction. Two prominent Jewish organizations, the Temple Institute and the Temple Mount and Eretz Yisrael Faithful Movement, lead the preparations for the construction of the Third Temple and the restoration of sacrificial worship. Alongside these, other groups have their own initiatives. One proposes erecting a tabernacle-style tent on the mount, while another advocates constructing a synagogue in a corner of the platform. Kaim Richman, the director of the Temple Institute, emphasizes the practical aspect of temple construction. Underlining the religious obligation to build the temple, referencing Exodus chapter 23 verse 8, and asserts that Jews should adhere to all 613 mitzvot, including those that necessitate a temple. Also in his discussion of the significance of the third temple, he expresses profound beliefs about its spiritual and universal importance. He suggests that the temple will serve as a beacon of divine light, symbolizing the return of the Lord's divine presence to the world, which had departed with the loss of the Temple Mount. Additionally, he envisions the temple as a unifying force, reconnecting all of creation and enabling humanity to establish a direct and dynamic relationship with God, thus facilitating the realization of individual potential. However, while these aspirations hold deep significance, insights from Daniel chapter 9 verse 11, all Israel has transgressed your law and turned aside, refusing to obey your voice, and the curse and oath that are written in the law of Moses the servant of God have been poured out upon us because we have sinned against him, and the Brit Shadasha present an alternative perspective on the temple's role in prophetic events. Despite this, preparations for the third temple persist. Ritual garments and sacred vessels have already been meticulously crafted, including the iconic golden menorah, and Levitical musical instruments, such as silver trumpets, lyres and harps, intended for worship akin to that of King David over three millennia ago. 1 Chronicles chapter 23, verse 5. The Temple Institute School is engaged in a unique endeavor, training certified Kohen, who are DNA-tested descendants of the High Priest Aaron, to fulfill the sacred duties within the Temple. This meticulous training ensures that individuals with the appropriate lineage and qualifications are prepared to carry out the intricate rituals and responsibilities prescribed by tradition. Furthermore, a crucial element in the preparations for Temple service is breeding the Red Heifer in Israel. This specific breed of heifer is designated for sacrifice in a ritual purification process essential for priests in sacred vessels. By undergoing this purification, they become ritually clean and are thereby enabled to enter the holiest of holy areas, considered the most sacred space on earth according to Jewish tradition. So what do you think of the red heifer's arrival in Israel? Comment below and subscribe for more.